who's joining us today. Welcome to today's CNCF webinar, Kubernetes Cluster Performance, Resource Management, and Cost Impact. I'm George Castro, Community Manager of VMware and a Cloud Native Ambassador. I'll be moderating today's webinar. We would like to welcome our presenters today, Elijah Oyenkunle, Platform Engineer at Replex, and Hashan Haider, Developer Marketing at Replex. A few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you're not able to talk as an attendee. There's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop in your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that Code of Conduct. Basically, please be respectful of all your fellow participants and presenters. With that, I'll hand it over to Elijah and Hajan to kick off today's presentation. Um, <clears throat> hello, everyone. Um, thanks a lot for joining us and welcome to the webinar. Um, so the topic that we're going to talk about today is uh, Kubernetes cluster performance, uh, resource management and cost impact. Uh, my name is Hasham and I'm the de developer advocate at Replex. Um, so I'll be going through some of the slides, um, just kind of putting the entire topic into context um, and explaining the context of cluster performance, you know, what we mean when we say cluster performance. Um, and then kind of identifying the metrics that are important in the context of cluster performance. Um, and then uh, we also have Elijah um, with us on the call who is um, uh, platform engineer at Triplex, um, and he'll be digging into a lot of the technical stuff, um, um, you know, digging into Prometheus, um, the queries that I use to monitor cluster uh, performance metrics, and um, yeah, also give us, you know, giving us a walkthrough of uh, a pre-built Grafana dashboard to monitor cluster performance. Um, he'll also be giving us an overview of the entire metrics flow from uh, Kubernetes to Prometheus to Grafana and um, yeah, everything, uh, everything in between. Um, all right, so um, just a couple of words about Replex before we get started. Um, so uh, Replex is a governance and cost management platform uh, purpose built for modern cloud native infrastructure. Um, so, I mean, essentially it gives finance and cloud managers um, a comprehensive look um, um, of visibility into total spend across, um, across uh, infrastructure. Um, and um, along with granular insights into the cost of individual applications and teams, um, you know, at the same time, um, uh, it empowers developers and operators to right size resources for, um, for optimal spend without sacrificing performance. Um, all right, cool. So yeah, let's get started. Um, you know, just to give some context to what we're going to be talking about here today. Um, uh, so we have a couple of statistics uh, in terms of performance and utilization um, that should nicely frame the topic. Uh, so uh, one is that 40% of instances are one to two sizes bigger than needed for their workloads. Um, so when we say that these instances are too big for their workloads, um, we're essentially talking about the fact that um, you know these instances are not being util utilized efficiently. Um, I mean, the utilization is low, so um, essentially low utilization translates into um, into resource wastage, uh, which in turn uh, means wasted spend. Um, as you can see in the second statistic, that you know we have fifty to seventy five percent of the money uh, being spent on these um, instances is is being uh, wasted. So, um, yeah, right now, I guess uh, you're probably thinking, you know, uh, this is a webinar about Kubernetes and containers. So, um, you know, why are we talking about cloud provider instances? So why should we be, be, be worried about instances and, you know, workload sizes and utilization? Um, so in fact, um, I mean, um, everyone can agree that Kubernetes, you know, kind of makes it easier for DevOps uh, to do their jobs. Um, you know, it essentially abstracts a lot of the heavy lifting uh, the DevOps teams usually do um, and makes it easier to uh, provision and manage infrastructure, you know, as, uh, um, or, as well as making it easier to manage containerized workloads. Uh, but, you know, what, what this essentially does is it leads to a lot more complexity under the hood and it also leads to a lot more complexity on the operational sides of things. Um, so um, when we talk about you know um, kind of complexity and and um, you know uh, the the the, uh, the 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 complexity that Kubernetes introduces on the operational sides of things, um, 
So, uh, I mean, in the context of performance and costs, uh, not only do we have to kind of consider the extent to which uh, the underlying infrastructure um, or, the, or the cloud instances that, that Kubernetes is essentially running on, you know, we don't only have to look at the utilization of, of that infrastructure, but we also have to think about the utilization of, uh, you know, pods or workloads um, and how well they are performing in terms of utilization and performance. Um, so, so one reason for this is uh, that Kubernetes introduces the concept of resource requests and limits. Um, resource requests are essentially the amount of resources that are reserved for a container. Um, and you know, once once these um, resources are reserved, uh, they cannot be used by any any, any other containers or pods. Um, resource limits, on the other hand, are the maximum amount of resources that can be consumed by by a container. Um, so, I mean. This essentially means that once you allocate resources to those containers, um, they are reserved for that container. Um, and, and what we have to be careful about is uh, whether, the, whether those containers are using uh, those allocated resources efficiently um, or not. Because you know, if they're not, um, essentially those resources are being wasted you know, and um, they're adding costs to the bottom line of the business uh, without actually being, uh, being used. Um, all right, so now um, that we've looked at, you know, why kind of it is important to monitor the utilization of, of Kubernetes clusters, um, um, we'll take a look at a couple of other numbers, you know, in the context of performance and costs. Um, so 14 billion is um, essentially being wasted yearly in public cloud spend on um, idle or unused resources, uh, you know, or provision instances. Um, 5.3 billion of this is wasted on oversized resources alone. Um, so, I mean, we see this as a huge problem where, I mean, most of these workloads and, you know, most of the infrastructure that is, um, that is provisioned to run these uh, workloads are not being utilized efficiently, uh, which is, you know, essentially driving up the costs without really adding anything to the, to the bottom line. Um, so yeah, I mean, um, in today's webinar, what we want to discuss is cluster performance and um, we're going to frame uh, this concept of cluster performance in terms of, um, you know, three distinct aspects. Um, the first one is cluster utilization. Uh, for cluster utilization, uh, we will explore um, kind of how efficiently uh, the underlying infrastructure is being used. Um, you know, what, what, what is the utilization of the individual cloud instances um, as well as of the cluster as a whole. Uh, we will also look into, you know, um, the, the, the concepts of under provisioning and all provisioning um, and how, you know, we could essentially lower cloud costs by targeting a higher utilization. Uh, then we look into workload efficiency. Um, so by workloads, you know, we mean containers and pods. And, um, you know, as we discussed earlier, um, Kubernetes kind of introduces this concept of resource requests and limits. Um, so we'll be looking at the efficiency of containers and pods. Um, uh, and, and whether they're being, you know, whether they're using the requested resources efficiently, um, you know, and if they're not, you know, what, what, what is, uh, what, what can be done to ensure that they're being used efficiently, you know, which, which can potentially give us a better utilization. Um, the third um, aspect that we want to talk about would be idle resources. And I mean, this would be more in the context of developer environments. Um, so uh, developer environments are often, uh, you know, only needed during the week, uh, the weekdays. Um, they do not need to run, you know, over the weekend maybe, or they do not need to run during off hours. Um, so kind of looking at, you know, how we could reduce the number of um, uh, these idle resources, you know, so that they, they do not add to the bottom line. And then, you know, just kind of a quick overview of these three concepts, and then we move on to a technical deep dive, um, identify the metrics, you know, that are important in terms of cluster performance, um, you know, how we can monitor them using open source tools like Prometheus and Grafana. Um, and yeah, I mean, then uh, kind of walk through um, through a pre-built Grafana dashboard. Um, so yeah, cool. Um, let's jump now to um, the cluster utilization aspect of um, um, cluster performance. So um, I mean, um, let's let's take the example of a Kubernetes cluster with a worker node. You know, like 
um, an M5 XLarge AWS instance. Um, so uh, we've got four pods running uh, on this instance um, and every pod is requesting one CPU. Uh, the limits are two CPUs. So, I mean, essentially what Kubernetes is going to do in, in this case is it's going to set aside, um, you know, it's going to guarantee one CPU for each pod. And this cannot, I mean, this one CPU cannot be then, once it's resolved, it cannot be used by any other port or container. Um, and I mean, so we also have limits of two CPUs. Um, so if, if a container, you know, starts to exceed the limits, um, it could be throttled by Kubernetes or it could move it to a new node. Um, you know, which has, which has enough resources to fulfill, uh, you know, the, requ the, the requirements of this board. Um, so yeah, I mean, what happens if um, our application starts to exceed uh, the maximum CPU allocation? So Kubernetes will essentially move this port to another node. Um, and now, um, I mean, the new node has um, uh, only has port four running um, on top of it. And I mean, it's essentially utilizing only 25% of the CPU resources um, that are available on this node. Um, and so, I mean, if you see the utilization of node one has also gone down since it's no longer supporting port four now. Um, and so, I mean, if you look at this, I mean, essentially, um, it's telling us that the size of the nodes is, um, is much bigger than what is, you know, kind of required for the pods that are running on top of it. Um, so, I mean, in this case, what we could do is kind of resize this node and replace it with one which has a much smaller uh, resource footprint. Um, so, for example, we could replace uh, this with a T2 medium AWS instance, uh, which has two CPUs and eight GB of memory. Uh, and I mean, essentially resizing node two will, will give us a much better utilization of 50%. Um, and then, I mean, the smaller, you know, AWS T2 instance, um, it also costs less. So, I mean, this essentially means that, you know, we are reducing resource wastage, uh, we are improving utilization, um, and we are cutting down on costs. All right, um, that was cluster utilization. Next, we'll um, kind of look at um, a mix of cluster and workload utilization. Um, um, so, I mean, yeah, we, again, we take the example of a node which has six pods running um, um, on top of it. And each of these nodes is requesting one CPU and um, they have a limit of two CPUs. Uh, but the real um, uh, uh, resource usage or consumption of these costs is, uh, you know, 0.2 CPU. Um, so essentially the pods are only utilizing 20% um, uh, of the allocated uh, CPU resources. And I mean, as you mentioned, since, uh, you know, these resources are reserved by Kubernetes, uh, they cannot be used by any other pods and are therefore being wasted, you know, and, you know, kind of adding to the costs. Um, and I mean, what, what, we want to bring forth in this is, I mean, essentially this is not very efficient because looking at the um, actual resource usage of the of the pods, we could we could have a much lower resource footprint uh, for these pods. Um, and I mean, if we do that, we reduce we reduce the requested resources to 2.3, uh, then we get a much better pod utilization of 75%. Um, um, and doing this will also um, kind of free up those resources, you know, to be used by other pods. Um, but uh, what does this mean for the node? I mean, we do get a much better CPU utilization for the pods, but the node still has the same uh, CPU footprint. And so it also makes sense, you know, in this case uh, to look at node utilization. And as you can see, I mean, we only get a no getting a node utilization of um, 15%. Um, um, so, I mean, essentially the reason for this is that the actual usage of our pods is still, uh, you know, the, the, the same, which is 0.2 CPU. And whereas, you know, our node still has, um, the larger resource footprint. So then, I mean, we could also reduce the size of the node, um, you know, and uh, if, if we kind of uh, use, um, um, uh, resize the node to two CPUs, you know, something like a T2 medium AWS instance. Um, so we get also a much better uh, or a much higher CPU utilization of 60% for the, for the node. Um, all right, so now, I mean, putting all of this in context and kind of thinking of this in terms of public cloud um, computing instances. So, um, you know, um, I mean, since most Kubernetes workloads are running on public cloud providers, you know, looking at the size of the cluster, you know, and the instances and the utilization and kind of making informed decisions um, to right size clusters based on, uh, based on actual utilization um, has, has huge implications for the, for the Kubernetes costs. 
Um, so, I mean, as you can see, we've got three instances, you know, that um, they have different resource footprints. Uh, they also have different price tags. Um, so essentially matching, you know, the size and usage of workloads with, with the actual footprint of four instances. Um, and then, you know, kind of choosing um, uh, the one which gives us a much better utilization, you know, is a great way to kind of reduce wastage, improve utilization, um, and also uh, reduce um, uh, public cloud provider spend. Um, but yeah, I mean, as, as you know, um, I guess in real life, it's not, it's not always as easy as that, you know, um, actual production clusters run multiple instances, you know, and um, organizations, you know, have multiple clusters. Um, so, I mean, essentially what makes sense in that case is to kind of look at um, this in terms of overall cluster utilization. Um, you know, and then um, taking proactive steps to uh, reduce, you know, or, or maybe increase the size of the cluster based on actual utilization um, and actual resource consumption, you know, and then making um, kind of informed decisions uh, based on that real-time data that is coming in. Um, moving on to the next aspect of cluster performance, you know, where we talk about development environments. Um, and I mean, to, to kind of put this in context, um, you know, development environments account for 44% uh, of compute spend. Um, and I mean, essentially, uh, these development environments, they, they do not need to run 24-7. Um, you know, they're, they're not production workloads. Uh, most of them do not need to run on the weekends. Um, you know, they do not need to be up and running um, during off hours. Um, so, I mean, in this section, we're going to look at some native Kubernetes abstractions um, that we can use to, to proactively monitor the, the resource consumption of, of uh, development environments, um, you know, and um, also to, to, to control it. Um, and to ensure that these workloads are not up and running 24 seven, you know, we can shut them off during off hours. Um, and in, in the process, we see uh, reduce uh, resource wastage and spend. Um, so uh, the first thing to do in this regard is to kind of isolate development environments and Kubernetes has this really nice abstraction to do that. Um, so Kubernetes has this concept called namespaces, um, which we can use to isolate all the resources, you know, that are spun up as part of the development environment. So we can create a namespace, <clears throat> a monolithic namespace, uh, namespace for the entire development environment, um, or, um, you know, de depending on the scope of uh, development activities, you know, we can also isolate uh, developer teams. Uh, so if you've got multiple teams, we can uh, create a separate namespace for each of those individual development teams. Um, you know, it kind of isolate the resources that are used by, the, by those teams um, using namespaces. Um, and I mean, since we are isolating the resources, we can then control the consumption of, of that namespace, the resource consum consumption of the namespace um, using other native Kubernetes, um, you know, tools. Um, and in the process also, you know, um, control the resource consumption of the developer environments or the developer teams as a whole. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, we'll, we'll take a look at some of these abstractions in the next couple of slides. Um, so once you've isolated the resources of the development teams uh, by creating separate namespaces, what we can then do is to kind of create, um, you know, default CPU requests and limits. Um, so, um, I mean, we can define these as part of a limit range object. And once we have this limit range object created, um, you know, Kubernetes will ensure, you know, that if any developer spins up a pod or container in that namespace um, without defining the requests and limits, um, so it'll automatically attach those default values to those containers. <clears throat> Um, we can do the same for memory requests and limits, um, you know, as part of a limit range object. Um, and, you know, Kubernetes will ensure that, you know, these, um, the default values that are defined in, in, the, in, the, um, in, the, limit, in the limit range object are automatically applied to any containers uh, that uh, do not have these limits um, uh, or requests defined. So with the limit range object, I mean, we can also control, control the minimum and maximum uh, CPU constraints for individual containers. Um, so we define a limit range object for the, for the developer namespace. Um, you know, um, um, we define the minimum, the, the maximum or the higher limit for the amount of CPU that can be allocated to individual containers. Um, and then we also define the minimum uh, amount of CPU that can be allocated to, to those containers. Um, and yeah, I mean, once we create this limit 
range object, you know, Kubernetes is going to ensure uh, that, you know, if um, uh, um, any container that is spun up, you know, um, the resource request and limits of, of that container, um, you know, is, uh, it, it falls within, within the specific range that we, that we define. Um, so yeah, I mean, essentially we are controlling the resource consumption of, of individual containers. Um, and then, I mean, since we, we've isolated these resources um, and we are talking about the development environment. So yeah, I mean, essentially we are controlling the resource consumption of, of the entire development environment. Um, uh, same goes for memory constraints. So we can define minimum memory, um, minimum and maximum memory constraints for individual containers um, and define a range. And yeah, I mean, Kubernetes will ensure that, you know, um, um, they fall within, within the defined range. Um, so another um, native Kubernetes object that we can um, use to control resource consumption is the resource quota. <clears throat> And with the resource quota, I mean, we can, we can control the resource, the, the total resource consumption of, of the developer namespace. So, um, I mean, we can define um, the upper limit on the amount of resources, on, on the total amount of resources that can be consumed by all the pods that are running in the developer namespace. Um, and we can also control the total amount of, uh, you know, resource requests of, of all the pods in the developer namespace. Um, and I mean, this will work for, um, for CPU uh, resources, for memory resources. Um, and yeah, I mean, we can also um, kind of control these for ephemeral storage. Um, and as part of the resource quota object, I mean, we can also control the number of pods that are allowed to run in the development developer namespace. Um, and I mean, in the same way, we can, we can, uh, we can control the number of services, um, we can control the number of persistent, volu uh, persistent volumes, um, uh, load balancers, node pods, and, and you know, replication controllers. Um, and I mean, you know, essentially since, since most of these objects, you know, are consuming CPU and memory resources from public cloud provider instances, or, you know, there may be abstractions on public cloud provider services. So for example, not, not ports or load balances, um, which are essentially, um, I mean, abstractions on the public cloud provider services. Um, so, I mean, they're essentially adding costs on the public cloud provider side. Um, so. I mean, since Kubernetes allows us to, you know, control the number of these objects um, that can run in the developer namespace. So, um, I mean, essentially it's allowing us to control um, um, the, the, the number of these objects and, you know, which essentially translates to um, controlling the public cloud spend that the developer environment, you know, is, is allowed to consume. Um, and yeah, I mean, since we also, um, isolating developer resources by, you know, either creating separate namespaces um, or, you know, uh, creating separate namespaces for individual developer teams. Um, so we are isolating the resources and, you know, we can kind of easily monitor the resource consumption and costs of these environments and teams. Um, we can quickly spin them down based on need. So, I mean, let's say on the weekends or, you know, in off hours, uh, we don't need those resources. So, so, so we can quickly spin them down, you know, since they've already been, um, uh, been isolated. Um, all right, um, yeah, cool. So um, now I'll, um, I'll ask Elijah to take off from here and, and we'll be doing um, a technical deep dive. Um, Elijah. Okay, thank you, Ashan. Um, I'll be sharing my screen now. Okay, um, hi everyone, um, I'm Elijah, and now we are going to be examining the metrics, um, the metrics that you can use to, to evaluate the performance of your Kubernetes cluster. So first we're going to be looking at, um, we're going to be examining where the Kubernetes metrics come from. Then we are going to be um, running some Prometheus queries to run some analysis um, on our cluster. And then we are going to be going, going through a Grafana dashboard that we have prepared for this presentation. So I have a, I have a Kubernetes cluster running, um, running now with three nodes. And I have some, I have some services. So Kubernetes, um, so um, 
Kubernetes metrics, the metrics for your Kubernetes cluster are um, two, they come from two useful sources. One is the node exporter that runs on, that runs on every node in the cluster and gets, um, gets low level metrics about each, each, each node in the cluster, such as the available memory, network devices, and, and a lot of other um, information that are provided by the kernel running on each node. Then we are also going to be examining the container specific metrics that I exposed with C advisor. So first um, we are going to see um, some of the metrics that are exposed um, by the node exporter. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to port forward this to, I'm going to forward the port for this service to my machine and then we're going to examine some of the metrics. Okay, so I visit this now. So these are the metrics that are exposed by the node exporter running on running on um, on my Kubernetes cluster. You can see a lot of a lot of metrics that have to do with um, the node file system. So the metrics exposed by the node exporter are all prefixed with the node underscore. So when you when you're going through your parameters metrics and you see a metric with this prefix that is coming from the node exporter, so we can see a lot of metrics um, around about the total nodes in your file system. You can see metrics about um, IPv um, connections, um, packets. Then here we come to some metrics that we that we would that we will fi find interesting. For example. We have memory. We have memory metrics here. Um, this, for example, uh, the this represents the available memory on on this node. Um, we can also see a lot of metrics around the free memory and total memory on the node. So um, there are lots. There are lots of other metrics here um, that have to do with um, network interfaces. Um, and so on, and these are metrics that you can. So Prometheus is configured to scrape um, this particular um, this particular endpoint on the node exporter, and all these metrics are going to be available to query upon. Next, we are going to um, look at some of the metrics that are exposed by the kubelet. So um, the node exporter exports metrics um, about the um, about the low level information for each node while the kubelet um, so I have I have uh, three nodes running in a cluster and I've forwarded one of the um, a port on one of my nodes to my local port so the kubelet runs on this port um, port 10 250 on each node and these are these are some of the metrics that are exposed by the kubelet um, so this, this metrics, um, we send a lot of kubelet specific information and then the C advisor metrics are metrics that, um, that are specific to each. So we are going to see a lot of really interesting container related metrics such as, um, CPU usage, uh, memory usage, uh, for each container. So the C advisor is a component of the kubelet that um, that gets that will, that's going to be getting these useful um, metrics to us. For example, we can see metrics around the container CPU load average over the last ten seconds. We can also see metrics around um, the total time that um, that, a, that a container was spent uh, spent executing. Um, system applications. We so this is this is one of the main. This is the main metric that is that is 
um, that is exported by the C advisor, the container CPU usage seconds. And with this, we can uh, we can get uh, we can get the metrics that are we can get the total CPU seconds that are used by each container in our metric. Uh, we can see some of the levels for each for this metric, such as the namespace, the port that the um, that the container is running as a part of. We can see the container name. Um, uh, the, the and then there's also the the instance that the that the con that the container is running on. So this um, so these metrics are exposed by the kubelets running on each node. And then our Prometheus cluster, our Prometheus um, installation has been configured to scrape um, so to scrape the kubelets that we have, as well as the C advisor endpoints, and also the node exporter. So when you install uh, Prometheus into your Kubernetes cluster, some of these are configured automatically uh, via service discovery. So you can see um, it's, it scrapes a lot of other uh, targets such as core DNS, the API server, and so some of the metrics that we've that we've just looked at um, over HTTP, we're going to we're going to try to exit, to run some queries on them now in the Prometheus portal. So one of the um, one of the metrics one of the queries that we're going to be running now is to calculate the CPU time consumed per CPU in nanoseconds. So this so this metric that we're going to be using is one of them is we just saw that it was exposed by the C advisor. Um, so what this query does is it aggregates this um, the overall overall CPU CPU usage over the past five minutes by namespace pod and container. So when we execute this query, we can see we can see um, we, so we get we get our results. So we can see the container name, the namespace, and then the pod running this particular container. And we can say it for all the containers in our cluster. So this is the the this is the total seconds that the container spent executing over the past five minutes. So next we're going to um we're going to I look at another uh, metric. We're going to look at another query to find, to calculate the total memory available in our cluster. And then we are going to be aggregating by node. So, so running this query now, we can see that um, we in our Kubernetes cluster, we have about 72% available memory. Um, in our Kubernetes cluster. Next, we're going to be looking at, so we can we can go to the graph section to see um, to see the trend in this particular query over the past one hour. Um, next, we're going to be looking at a query to um, to calculate um, the the, the non-idle CPU usage of um, of our Kubernetes, of our CPUs. So um, this node CPU seconds total metric is exported by the um, node exporter. Um, so we can, we can see where it is here. Um, you okay. So on this um, on this node, we can see that it's, it tells us um, how many seconds the CPU spent in each mode. So the I2 mode is time spent by the CPU um, doing nothing. The user mode is time spent running user processes while system is time spent running system processes. Then we have we have a bunch of other nodes of other modes also that um, that the CPU has spent some time in. So the idle mode is um, so. All this 
for this program mode, the CPU is actually um, do, is actually being active, but when it's idle, that's uh, the time that the CPU isn't doing anything at all. So you would want to ensure that you are getting that your CPU isn't idle um, a lot of the time. So this query is going to tell us how much time um, the how much time our CPU has spent in the um, so we because we're subtracting it from, from one, the what this is going to return is the time that the CPU spent not idle. So we can see that um, that's about 11%. So this cluster has really low CPU utilization um, of about 11%. Um, so, so yes, so this, um, so we've, we've looked at three queries now that um, we can use to, um, to, get some, to get some overview about into the current utilization of your cluster. But um, this, so, so with these queries, you can be able to build an actual dashboard that you're going to be using to monitor the um, the current performance of your dashboard at, of your cluster at a particular time. So one of a very useful tool to do that is Grafana, and Grafana has built-in support for Prometheus. So what we've done is we've built um, uh, we've built a Grafana dashboard running some running some queries um, using the Prometheus plugin. And we are going to be taking a look, taking a look at um, some of the queries that are powering each of this, each of these charts that you're seeing here. So um, this dashboard that we have here is divided into four sections. We have a cluster general overview. Um, of the utilization in the cluster. Then we have we have a breakdown by pod, we have a breakdown by namespace, then we have a breakdown by node. So um, taking a look at our cluster um, overview, the CPU utilization chart is showing us how much um, how much of our CPU is being utilized at this particular time. Um, memory utilization is doing the same for memory while uh, the disk utilization is, is telling us how much free um, disk we have on each of our nodes. The CPU request commitment is, um, is so um, one of the ways to, um, to manage, to manage, um, to manage cluster resources as the has pointed out is um, through is by specifying CPU requests and memory requests for each pod in your for your for your pods. So this is telling us how much um, CPU has been requested um, by the pods in our cluster as a, as a percentage of the overall CPU that we have. Um, and this is doing the same for for memory. So the query behind this CPU utilization. Um, graph is um, this is it and that's um, that's the query that we just as it is there in the portal so um, yeah so so this is the time this is the total um, this is the total time that the CPU has spent in a non idle mode next we're going to look at our CPU our memory utilization chart um, so this is the query that has been ex executed because um, um, just taking, just taking, um, just dividing the three bytes by the power bytes is not going to account for some for some other kinds of memory that the kernel is is using for cache and, and buffers at particular time. So we're going to add up everything. So this presents us a realistic um, figure for how much of our memory is being used at the moment and divided by the total memory for our nodes and then um, remove that from one. So that's how we get the total memory utilization at this particular time. Next, the disk utilization. So this is a metric that is also um, exported by the, by the node exporter. And you can, you can see, um, so we're dividing the three bytes by the total bytes. 
um, star file system bytes, and that's how we're getting our disk utilization. Next, for our CPU requests, uh, this is the query that we are running to get this to get this um, graph here, and then we also have um, we also have a chat here for the memory request. Next, we're going to go to um, the port overview section. So here we are, we are displaying the CPU usage per port in our cluster. And this is, um, this is showing up as cores. So um, this, so this is going to, this is telling us how much um, CPU cores each code in the cluster is using at, at the time and is plotting it out here. The query behind this is, so this is the query we're running for that. Next, we'll look at the memory usage. So this is um, this is this is listing um, all the pods in our cluster in descending order of how much memory each is using at this particular time. And this is the main metric that that's powering this. And we and so we are aggregating by port. Next, we take a look at um, the CPU requests. Um, chat. So here we, so this is this is the query that we are running, and we are aggregating by code. And then, lastly, we have the memory requests section. Um, also, I've been getting the memory requested by code in the cluster. So the namespace section um, has graphs um, similar to the ones we have here, but instead of aggregating by port, we'll be aggregating by namespace. Then we do the same for memory usage, CPU requests, and memory requests. Then in our node section, we also have um, similar charts here. And, the, and here you can see it's, it's aggregated by node. Then we, we now have an extra three sections for CPU utilization, um, aggregated by node. So this this uh, this is a fairly complex query, but the main the main query we, the main method we're using here is the node CPU seconds total, and so it's and then um, we so we are we are also subtracting um, from one so the total time that the CPU has spent idle, and then we are running a join um to to um to an existing um to an existing prometheus rule so what this so combining this what this gives us is the total cb um cb utilization for each node in the cluster and then we also have memory utilization um graph here and then we have disk utilization. So um, so this what this dashboard can give you at a very quick glance is insight into the current um, utilization and performance of of your cluster at um, over the past 15 minutes. So this um, so this is provided by Grafana you can you can um, you can increase the the visible, you can increase the range um, that's, that is displayed by each graph here. You can also increase or reduce the refresh rates of the graphs that are displayed here. So, um, to, so to wind up uh, this, um, this section, you can, we've taken a look at some of the Prometheus targets that expose um, useful metrics in our cluster. And that's the kubelet, the node exporter, and the shared visor. And we've taken a look at the Prometheus portal. And lastly, we've um, we've seen how this come together to give a really good overview of the Kubernetes cluster in a dashboard. So um, with this, you can have a lot more insight into the behavior of your Kubernetes cluster. So that does it. And I'll be handing over to Asham to conclude the uh, webinar. Thank you.
Um, thanks, um, Elijah, um, for taking us through Prometheus and, and the Grafana dashboards. Um, so to wrap up, um, here are a couple of uh, dashboards from the Reflex platform. Uh, this, this first screenshot is, you know, it's, it's a Kubernetes optimization report from Reflex, which, you know, kind of gives us an overview of the total Kubernetes costs, um, you know, um, and the potential savings we can make by optimizing our clusters. Um, the costs are, you know, also broken down by cloud. Um, they're broken down by cluster. Um, and for every cluster, uh, we get real-time alerts and notifications um, with, with a set of actions, uh, you know, which can help us improve utilization and um, and kind of reduce costs. So, um, I mean, yeah, that's um, that's essentially uh, you know kind of optimizing um, cluster footprints in real time to uh, to reduce costs and you know kind of improve utilization. Um, the second dashboard is a finance dashboard which uh, breaks down Kubernetes costs by. Uh, teams um, and uh, by the cloud providers. Um, so, I mean, one major concern that we come across in, in our conversations with customers is, you know, the inherent opaqueness of Kubernetes. Um, you know, users don't have visibility into, uh, into who is using what on Kubernetes. You know, there's no way to allocate costs because, um, because of the shared resources model of Kubernetes. Um, so, I mean, essentially this keyboard uh, breaks down Kubernetes costs by team um, we can also do this for other custom attractions, you know, we can break them down by projects, we can do that for environments, um, you know, departments or applications, um, or I mean, we can do that on any other custom labels, you know, that are useful for organizations. Um, so yeah, I mean, just kind of breaking down um, Kubernetes costs um, and getting more visibility, uh, you know, into, uh, into who is using what in Kubernetes. Um, all right, cool. Yeah, so I mean, this brings us to the um, end of the webinar, and um, now I'm going to um, hand it back over to uh, to George. Okay, we do have questions, and we we have about twelve minutes for questions. Uh, the first question is from Nikhil Jean. Says, "Hi, how do I do the cost estimation of any Kubernetes architecture before actually putting it into practice?" Um, yeah, I'll take that one. So, um, I mean, essentially, um, there are ways that you can do cost uh, estimations of, of, um, of Kubernetes. Um, but I mean, you would have to kind of hard code the numbers in um, to, to kind of, uh, you know, get, um, get correct numbers. You would also need to maybe plug in into cloud provider billing APIs. Um, I mean, and yeah, I mean, I guess that is the only way to kind of come up with, you know, um, with accurate numbers for, you know, Kubernetes costs. Um, yeah, I mean, if you look on Grafana, you can, um, you know, there are, there are a couple of, you know, open source dashboards. Uh, they do allow you to do some sort of cost estimation, but I mean, the numbers in there are kind of um, fixed, you know, they are hard, hard coded into the dashboards themselves. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, you cannot, I guess you cannot really, um, you know, uh, because I mean, with public cloud providers, you know, you have a huge range of, uh, let's say instances, you know, and when you think about storage and so on, um, so kind of getting all of that information hard coded in is not really, I guess it's not really pr uh, practical. So um, yeah, I mean, to do really um, uh, kind of accurate cost estimation, you would, I guess, need to plug in into um, into cloud provider APIs. And yeah, with Reblex, you can do that. <laughs> yeah, uh, Sudeep, uh, this seems to be more of a statement than a question. It says, I was already thinking about optimization of pods using various mechanisms like C groups, maybe. So I don't know if that's just a statement to one of your previous parts. Um, however, they go on to ask a question. Um, mm -hmm. How does the resource request limits for CPU memory translate to C groups on the container runtime like Docker via the kubelet? Okay, so um, I'm going to take that. So C groups, um, C groups are a Linux kind of feature. Um, so they allow processes to be. Uh, so you can you can uh, you can control the amount of memory and CPU that um, that processes are using. So basically, you use it to modify the runtime environment of processes in um, of in of the runtime environments of your processes. So um, the Docker engine. 
um, relies on this uh, on this group's feature, and um, it pro it provides some flags that, um, um, for for example, CPU sets. Um, so this this are um, this are this are part of the C groups controller space. So um, CPU set, for example, is used to assign um, individual CPUs to um, to the tasks in a C group. So when the kubelet um, starts to execute your um, starts to execute your um, your containers, it's going to specify the CPU set and memory. Um, so these are these are parts of the um, C groups um, V1 controller space. So um, the memory um, feature, for example, limits memory used by the tasks in the C group, and then um, also provides reports on the on the on the memory usage of each task. So the kubelet specifies the CPU set and memory, um, and so that that controls the um, the assignment of CPUs <coughs> to the tasks and also the um, and also the memory. So that's so that's basically how the um, the resource requests are translated to the C groups in the container runtime. Okay, and that seems to be the last question. Um, I guess I can go ahead and answer last call for questions uh, for those of you out there. I'll just give it a few seconds there, and if not, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. All right, great. Thanks, Elijah and Hashan, for a great presentation. Uh, that's all the questions we have time for. Oh, wait, there's one question. Uh, I'm going to, Nikhil, I'm going to give you time to type it there. It looks like you're typing, uh, typing as we're doing. Okay, he says, uh, they're planning on doing an on-premise VM. How shall I do the estimation? Um, does he mean, I guess he means the cost estimation, right? Um, yeah, so I mean, we do provide that. Um, as, as part of the Replex platform. So, I mean, yeah, of course, it's, it's definitely possible to do um, cost estimations for, um, you know, on, on prem VMs. Um, yeah, but I mean, since, um, you know, most public, most, most Kubernetes workloads are running on public cloud providers. So, we kind of um, targeted this webinar mostly towards public cloud providers. But yeah, I mean, of course, it's definitely possible to do that. Um, on, um, you know, on, on-prem um, infrastructure. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if Nikhil requires any more information, I mean, we can definitely get back to him about that. Okay. And that's all the questions we have time for. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, the webinar recording and the slides will be online later on today. And we're looking forward to seeing you at a future CNCF webinar. All right, have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks everyone. Yeah, right.